As we're now in public session, colleagues, once again, to remind you about the mobile phones, either switch them off or to flight mode. And the note on privilege, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. The opening statement that you have submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting, and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. And I'm pleased to welcome uh, Dr Ronan Lyons, Assistant Professor in Trinity College this afternoon. Uh, Professor Lyons, first of all, I'd very much like to thank you for coming. Um, I'm very sorry that the previous occasion you were scheduled for, due to dull business, had to be cancelled. So thank you for accepting the cancellation and reappearing. Much appreciated from the committee's point of view. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to make an opening statement, colleagues, I'm sure we'll have a number of questions for you then. Thank sure. You. Um, well, well, firstly, I'd like to thank the, uh, the committee for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to speak. Um, I know you guys are, are very busy. This is a very important task, and you have limited time. So I, I, I very much appreciate um, and am honoured at the opportunity to, to talk to you. Uh, and uh, I should point out as well that I, I'd like to apologise for any typos in the document. It was prepared for the first invitation, so I had about a 24-hour window. Um, so if, if something uh, seems to not make sense, you can certainly uh, pull me up on it, um, and I'll go off and, and fix it later on. Um, the, uh, my aim today is to try and present a what I would call a system-wide view, um, and that's not to, I suppose, that's not to denigrate the contribution of other stakeholders. They have a particular perspective. Um, but given my role and given the research I do, I thought it might be useful to try and bring a systems perspective um, and, and think about how we would build a, a healthy housing sector, a healthy housing system that gives a meaningful right to, to housing for all Irish um, people. Uh, to do that, uh, I think it's important that it, what we do uh, and what I say is based to the greatest extent possible on, on theory and evidence um, rather than priors and um, for what it's worth I'm, I'm not politically affiliated uh, and I try to the best I can um, set prior beliefs aside um, and see what the evidence um, tells me um, because you know from past experience priors can often uh, take you in the wrong direction. Uh, by a brief mention of my background um, I I am a, a, an economist with a, a specialisation in, in housing, and I look particularly at the Irish, um, the, the Irish economy. Uh, I did my PhD in Oxford, 2009-2013, um, uh, on the, the recent Irish housing bubble and crash, uh, and I took up a post in Trinity in, in 2013, and I've, I've been there since. And the vast majority of the research I do in Trinity is looking at the housing market, and, and the bulk of that would be the Irish housing market, although that, that is shifting a little bit. Uh, I suppose some of the deputies may uh, be aware of my role with, with DAFT.ie as well, so uh, I work with them and have done since long before even I, I undertook the, the PhD. Um, I've worked with them for about 12 years, uh, and the, the aim of those reports is just to measure the market, um, to, to give the facts and figures, um, and uh, there is a commentary as well, but it's, it's come hell or high water, these figures, and in the early days it wasn't popular because prices were falling, um, these figures would get published. So that's the work I do with, with DAFT, and I also do uh, work with public and private bodies uh, in relation to particular aspects of, of, of housing broadly defined. And so in the last couple of years, I would have done some work um, on social housing, on student accommodation, on housing for older persons, as well as the, the sort of the bread and butter uh, general housing market. The, um, the context, uh, so that's the background, the context uh, is, is well known. It's what I would call system-wide shortage. The, uh, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about market housing or social housing, uh, if it's student accommodation, general housing, uh, nursing home beds, hotel rooms, uh, it's just a shortage of, um, uh, of accommodation. You might even call it a shortage of, of, of space, but actually when you look at the office sector, um, there is no problem at the moment providing office space, and in fact, uh, half a million square metres of office space is either 
being built or about to be built. Um, so that is, I think, an important um, difference between residential and commercial, which uh, I can come back to. One number, and it's, it's a, a number I use to focus my comments, is if we just take the Greater Dublin area, uh, roughly speaking in the 2010s, between 2010 and 2020, there will be approximately 100,000, maybe more, uh, new households formed, not all families, new households formed in those 10 years. Against that 100,000 um, extra demand, um, and sorry, I use demand and supply as I'm trained as an economist, I can't shake them, um, uh, 100,000 demand for new units, we will probably see, and this is just the Dublin area, maybe between 25 and 30,000 units built in the same 10-year period. Um, so this is, uh, as you well know, uh, critically important, and uh, that's what got me thinking in, in a more of a, a, a systematic way. Um, so what I thought I would do, uh, you've, you've had the document maybe for a couple of days or maybe for a couple of weeks, I'm not sure, um, but it was just give a quick overview and then I'm sure you'll have questions on the document and I can explain myself um, a little bit better. Um, what I hope we can agree on, and I, hope, I think everyone in Ireland would agree on, is that what we want the housing system to do is to provide a meaningful right to housing for all. You could write it into the Constitution, but that wouldn't necessarily change anything um, on the ground. What you want to do is put in place the policy that actually brings about the housing and, and the access to housing. Um, so the way I would think about it is uh, a healthy housing system is one where when you have new demand, there's new supply. <coughs> that it, the system responds by building new accommodation of the type that's needed. So if it's FDI creating a, a thousand new jobs, that there is somewhere to live for all those new people. And I have new colleagues starting in Trinity, um, coming from abroad in September, and you know, they're currently flying back and forth from New York to try and find somewhere to live. And one of them said to me yesterday, this is the worst market I've ever seen, and I've lived in New York and Oxford, and those are two notoriously unhealthy uh, housing markets, and this is worse than that. So whatever it is, and if it's refugees, if we want to take in Syrian refugees, do we have somewhere to accommodate them? Or if it's, we just decide to have, the population is growing for natural increase. So for me, whether they're high income or low income, whether they're Irish or just choose to live here because they see the opportunities in the employment um, we should have a housing system that responds. And that's the barometer I'd like policy to move to, and that's where the four key policy areas um, come from. And, and that's, I'll, I'll just outline them in brief, and then we can open it up for discussion. So the first is, uh, it's the mortgage system. It's, it's making sure we have a safe mortgage system, because that, what, what that does uh, is means we have a safe level of house prices. So we all know from 95 to 2007, 2008, um, house prices rose by far too much, and I think it's, it's one of the, the graphs. Uh, it's um, just below paragraph 08, um, you, and again in the graph um, on, uh, above 1-1, one, one, uh, you can see just how off the scale the Irish housing bubble was, and therefore it's fundamentally important that we do not go anywhere down that road again. And in that context, the central bank rules are very important, but I do believe that one important tweak to those is, is required, and that's focusing on loan to value and moving away from loan to income. And the reason for that becomes clear when you think about land, the final area I'll talk about. When you look at the price of housing in Dublin versus the, pr the price of housing elsewhere, it's, it's, that does not create, or in that environment you cannot have um, a loan to income system that works countrywide. It'll only work in either Dublin or the rest of the country. So I think the mortgage rules are very important, but I do think that that tweak there, focusing more on loan to value than, than loan to income, would make them even better. Even if they're not changed, we are incredibly unlikely to go down the route of the same bubble. So as I say, if it's take them as they are or have none, I would definitely take them as they are, but I would tweak them slightly. But I regard that as, as work underway, and the central bank governor has said he will review um, the rules, and I will be talking to him about those. Um, I think the urgent areas for policy, the first is in relation to the cost of construction in Ireland, or what I've called in the document an efficient construction industry. Because if the central bank is capping house prices relative to people's incomes, if nobody's capping costs relative to people's incomes, you will end up in a situation where house prices and rents are high, but nobody is building. And I think there is a common misunderstanding there, even the SRI, I think, um, said it at one point, that it seems to defy economic logic, that, that there's all these big increases in prices and rents, but no increase in supply. It makes perfect sense if costs are, are too high. And the, 
the, the, I suppose if I could leave one thing with you, and I, I hope to leave more than one, but if I could leave one thing with you, it would be to uh, impress upon the Minister or whoever is responsible for implementing a report that until we have an open government-sponsored audit of construction costs, what does it take uh, all the different elements of building an apartment block or building a semi-detached home or building a rural one-off? Until we have that and compared to other countries, we will not know what are the most important actions we need to take to boost supply. There are lots of figures out there, but there's lots of disagreement out there. And the government is able to say, well, those figures are provided by estate agents or those figures are provided by developers. You know, how am I supposed to know? And there's lots of disagreement. Any time I mention something on radio, oh, it, it might be safety certification or something else. I have people ringing up and saying, you're definitely right, it is. And someone else saying, no, it only costs this. There is such a disagreement of evidence out there that we need the government to have its own evidence and it cannot then disavow its own evidence and it'll say okay here's where the costs are and here's where the priorities are and it could be regulations it could be wages but i suspect there are other things in there that are driving costs up including lack of efficiency in, in a more general sense the uh, that's the, the first area is mortgage rules the second area is cost of construction the third area and this i think along with cost of construction is the key priority for this committee and for the new minister is in relation to subsidising housing for those who do not have sufficient income. So you can bring income costs, or sorry, you can bring construction costs down in line with our own incomes in the same way that the, the central bank has capped prices relative to our incomes. But there will always be a certain fraction of the population who cannot afford um, those, th that level of construction costs. And I, I work it out in some detail in the document. If you take a particular family, say uh, you take a family earning 45,000 a year, they cannot affordably spend more than a thousand euro a month on, on their rent, but if it costs them 1,600 euro a month, break even, um, to provide them with accommodation, what we're saying is that there should be a subsidy of 600 euro a month for that household. Now, we don't have a, a subsidy system that's anything like that. We have a subsidy system that, that pushes it onto those who buy new properties, that's the part five, and we have a subsidy system that doesn't even take account of your income once you qualify. So somebody with no income gets the same subsidy as somebody with just below the threshold. And what we need to make a meaningful right for housing for all is once we sort out construction costs is to have a subsidy that covers the gap between your income, you shouldn't be spending more than a third of your disposable income on a monthly basis um, on, on your, your housing and the cost of providing you with accommodation. And I know I'm, I'm uh, pushing my five minutes uh, very generously, um, but the uh, oh, thank you. Um, the that also renders somewhat irrelevant the debate about how much the, should the government be building directly um, versus uh, housing bodies or the private sector. I see local authorities as, as predominantly providers of land for approved housing bodies to build social housing. If we have a subsidy that matches construction costs and your household income and says your household circumstances are such that you need a subsidy of X per month. That is the fundamental collateral that a housing body needs to go off and say to international capital markets, yes, we can go and provide a thousand homes um, for those on lower incomes and we'll be able to pay you back. And I know working with, with Clude in the past that there was lots of interest from international capital because they say this is a country with lots of unemployment, there must be lots of social housing. Um, and, and they were able to say, unfortunately, they had to say, unfortunately, our system doesn't work like that. Um, and it should work like that. And Austria and New York City have versions of this kind of system um, where the, the less you earn, the more help you get to make sure you can, um, uh, you have effective demand, not just um, uh, notional demand for, for housing. And the, the last area, so there's the mortgage rules, construction costs, housing subsidies. The last area is the cost of construction or the cost of a home is not just the hard building costs, it's also the cost of land. And this ties back to the mortgage rules. If you look back at the figures for the average price of a house in Dublin versus the average price of a house outside Dublin, even just 30 years ago, they were roughly the same. And I think I have it in the document, it's something like 48,000 for an average house in Dublin and 45 outside Dublin. And sure, the Dublin house is going to have a smaller garden or maybe a bedroom less, but the sticker price, the price you pay, you trade location for size, you choose to live more centrally and you have a smaller property. Um, now, the premium for living in Dublin is 70 or 75 percent rather than 5 or 10 percent. And ultimately, I believe that that comes down to how we use land. Uh, this is not a politically easy uh, thing to fix because you're talking about uh, changing the way we do property tax. But I think the, the politically most acceptable way of doing it is to 
ignore the, 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 the homes and, and look at commercially used land and treat development land for residential as equivalent to commercial land and tax them the same way, and that's with a land value tax. So if you have, and I, uh, I got into a row with Dublin City Council about this because I pointed out that Dublin Industrial Estate is 170 acres within Dublin City Council limits. And my contention is that it's, it's very poorly used land. There's so much empty industrial space on the M50 and the, the, the National Road corridors that if, you, if it were destroyed in an earthquake tomorrow, all the occupants would easily find uh, new industrial space on the M50. It is where the Cross City Lewis is going to terminate. So the, the, the terminus of the Cross City Lewis is in a half-used industrial estate, um, which I find uh, astounding. Um, it's close to DIT, the new campus there, it's close to O'Connell Street. This is phenomenal potential residential land. But currently the way the City Council thinks is we would have to CPO, compulsory purchase order, all of that land and there's huge title issues and we don't want to get into that. With a land value tax, you put all the logistical pressure onto the private sector. You say if you want to stay in this valuable land as a half-use industrial estate, you have to pay the price to society. Um, or if you want to develop it, you have to buy them out. Um, and it's a, it's a combination of the two. That's what a land value tax does. And by doing that, we could get land significantly cheaper, but we'd also need to review land use restrictions. Uh, and I'm, I was quite concerned to read yesterday that, again, Dublin City Council um, has, uh, some of the members of the council are, are trying to bring in more restrictive height restrictions. Uh, and the international evidence is that the best way to keep housing affordable is to allow it to build up where it's it's going to pay for itself, not willy-nilly, but where it will pay for itself. And unfortunately, we seem to be moving away from that. Um, so I think if we, if we do that, if we, particularly in the next two years, target construction costs and how we subsidise social housing, in the next five to ten years, reform how we use land, I think we can have a very healthy housing sector that provides a meaningful right to housing for all. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop there because I have gone well over my five minutes now, and I'll, I'll open it up to, um, to comments or questions. And thank you again for your time. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. <coughs> Who would like to start? Uh, Deputy O'Dowd. I just want to, to welcome uh, your comments and to say that I find them certainly thought-provoking and your analysis, I think, is, is I, I agree with a lot of it. But just, I think what happened during the boom uh, was that the, you know, people made a fortune and people, I suppose, uh, allowed that to happen. The system allowed it to happen because everybody was happy, except the guy that was paying the mortgage or the person that couldn't couldn't get a house. Um, and I, I sort of, one of my big views that I have is that is making local authority or indeed state-owned land, which is already owned by the state or, or semi-state bodies like, say, appropriately Irish Rail or health boards or whatever, that that is already owned by, by the state. So we should make that available at a fixed price, basically. In other words, the land is free to the state. I know it might have cost money to buy in the beginning, but if you make it available to qualified people, either for social housing or I think affordable housing is a huge issue, uh, which I find a lot of people want to buy their own house. They can't. They're on the housing list. They can't get the mortgage because they haven't got the, you know, the 10% or whatever it is. And I think you're talking about a fixed price. You know, if you, if you could design a house of, obviously, you know, three bedrooms, or whatever it is, or whether it's apartments or whatever, but if you say to the builder, you know, you know, we'll, you know, we, we'll fund the building of these houses if we fix the price at whatever it is. Is that, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Like, if you look at Gormanstown, which I keep talking about, it's about 200 acres of land owned beside the motorway, beside the railway, uh, you know, near enough to Dublin, near enough to facilities. And if you could make that available to people who can't afford to, to buy the land, but could maybe pay the mortgage on, on the building cost of the house, to me, that makes the most sense to those particularly who... You know, who need who need to get a step on the ladder, who need to start off. And I don't know what view you have on that. And the, the other the other point is that um you know, like um I, I, I think that social housing and the mix of social housing, you're quite right about New York. I was in New York and I went to this probably the most expensive apartment block in, in New York, but it was the best it was a it was zero uh, it, it was a carbon neutral. And 10% of all the people who lived in that, and it cost maybe $100,000, $200,000 to live there, were actually uh, social housing applicants. Or they were actually in the, and nobody, they weren't identified by any way or any means. But what you're saying is right, that everybody had a chance there to get into, you know, a fine quality 
product in terms of their family needs and so on. I think we need to change radically. There's too many people in this country, there's too many vested interests, and I think, you know, they, they, you know, we've all fallen on hard times because of that. I suppose that's more of a statement than a, than a question. But at the heart of what I'm saying is, I think it's what you're saying, is you've got to make it affordable for people, and you've got to use the state resources to do that. And if you give that to the right person or as the qualifying people, that gives them a huge, a huge start up, I think. Thank you, Deputy O'Dowd. I'll take a couple of contributions sure. before I come back to you. Deputy O'Brien. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Ronan, for the presentation. <clears throat> I suppose, like you, I, I look at the housing system as a system. Um, uh, and one of the important things for our committee to consider is what you do in one bit of the system doesn't just impact on that bit, but it affects the system overall. And one of my concerns and, and one of the things we're looking at is, is because of the historic failure to invest in the adequate provision of social housing, that's made other aspects of the system over-congested and lopsided. Um, and I say that just because I have three specific questions. There is the ongoing dispute about the cost of the private bills. Three kind of major players on the industry side, although NAMA will uh, be annoyed for me calling them on the industry side, but they kind of reflect the thinking on that. NAMA, Construction Industry Federation and the Institute of Charter Surveyors are all talking about, you know, a Dublin three beds, 1,200 square feet, 330 as the all-in cost. Um, and while I absolutely support your proposal to have a, a, a government-backed database so we have up-to-date uh, uh, prices, the difficulty is this government is going to take some decisions in terms of measures or may take some decisions in terms of measures to bring down those costs before such a database exists. So can you tell the committee your view on some of the proposals that are out there to reduce costs from some of those bodies who are quoting those higher end figures, particularly the VAT reductions, development levy reductions, etc. Um, and if you are supportive of those, do you see downsides in terms of the loss of revenue on the local authority end or the exchequer end from those? On the social, one of the things that just seems to me is, is people need to get their heads around a percentage of your housing stock should be in the social sector. Uh, and again, from your own research of, say, more stable housing systems in Europe, is there a standard? Um, I mean, we have about 10 percent currently. You know, do we need 20 percent? Do we need 30 percent? Before you get into who provides those, what is the sufficient supply of social that helps stabilise the overall system? <clears throat> and in that context, I suppose, my concern with your proposal for the approved housing bodies is even if they were operating to the maximum of their ability, if they were able to get the credit that they currently say they want, they'd only be able to produce about 4,000 units a year and it would take them several years to get to that. So given the level of housing need we have, why do you seem to write out local authorities also filling that space but on a much larger scale, in addition to the approved housing bodies, um, just in terms of the delivery of it? And the last bit, you said the least about the private rental sector. Um, and again, it's one of the least regulated bits of our system. I'm just interested in your thoughts on the record in terms of how we could stabilise that sector, both from the point of view of security of tenure and rent certainty for tenants, but also how we make the, the supply end more professionalised and stable and less volatile. Deputy, Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor. Thank you for his, his, his submissions. I, I agree with some of his comments, and I strongly disagree with others, I can assure you, particularly in relation to, to land to, uh, from the local authorities transferring to housing bodies. I don't, uh, I cannot get the logic of that at all. Uh, in actual fact, the reverse is the way I'd like to see it uh, happening. And I want to ask, that the, the, for, in, for example, an example would be, long before we had uh, the kind of situation we have now, we had the local authorities building a large number of local authority houses and lending a, an equal amount of loans to, to, to uh, enable people to buy their own affordable houses. We had that happening for many, many years and it worked extremely well. And we didn't have a housing crisis because they were able to meet their obligations, they were able to plan ahead, they knew what the requirements were going to be, just in the same way as we are supposed to know what school place requirements are supposed to be and health service requirements and so on. But in recent times, I think we've lost the sight of it. And one of the problems was that we shifted over from the local authorities to a, effectively a privatised system and it simply didn't work and it's not working now and worse or still to my mind is the problem that we now have a legacy from the housing bubble 
the legacy of inflation of, 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 of development property, potentially development property. And that has not gone away yet. And there is an obligation on us to provide, we have, we have a social obligation to provide for everybody, to provide an, a, an access route to housing. We do not necessarily have an obligation that everybody should make a profit on the course of it. But one of the things I would ask you is this, to what extent have you studied the degree to which various properties were acquired during the, the bubble and turned over on numerous occasions before there was ever a sod turned, uh, which gave a new value an artificial value to, to uh, potentially building uh, property, but also, and more particularly, it was done at a time, as, as the, that still exists, of very, very low interest rates, internationally all-time low interest rates, which made it much more attractive for people to do just that. And we can list a number of the prime housing sites in this city and in the, the adjoining counties where this actually happened. In relation to... Um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm concerned about that because, unfortunately, I would like to, I don't want to see us go down the same road further and, 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 and reap the whirlwinds of an even worse situation. In relation to the employment potential of, of the provision of housing, too, to what extent have you, have you actually uh, quantified that in the context of your study? Because I think it's of considerable importance as well. And you mentioned also the, 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 the housing demand, the market, the market the demand. I would, I would rephrase that. It is the housing requirement. This is, it, it's almost a life and death issue, a requirement for a roof over the heads of many people in the country, many families in the country. And the last and second last point, respectively, that, that I would make is you, 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 I think you, you identified the, the, the control of costs. J.K. Galbraith, in, in fact, during Keynesian times, identified uh, the control of costs and, and claimed, and rightly so, that you couldn't have uh, a, a incentives introduced into the marketplace to support and boost some parts of the economy without have controlling costs, because otherwise it led to massive inflation. So that part, that part I agree with. Uh, but the other, part, uh, I, the other parts, I have deep, deep, deep concern about them. And the other one, which you have addressed, in fact, is the pro proportion of household income that has to be dedicated to, to, to paying the mortgage or the rent, and the degree to which that is increasing, and what is the cause of that. I would say speculation that I've referred to, the kind of rollover speculation that I've referred to, I think is one of the causes of that problem. And the, the oh yes, one last point, you like this one, Chairman. I was, I was, I was, yeah, I was I commented so. on unfavourably when I made the reference, the comparison to, for instance, uh, people on a doll deputy salary being unable to pay the four or five hundred uh, thousand euro mortgage today. And that's correct. And it's so simple to work it out. First of all, let's take a, a family or a person on a hundred thousand, hundred thousand a year, right? How much of that do they take home? They take home fifty. That's what they take. Exactly half of it. Unless somebody's getting on my salary and the rest of your salaries that, that I don't know about. But that's what it works out at. It used to be two and a half times, two and a half times the, 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 the income of the main earner. Two and a half times. Two and a half times of a hundred thousand. We know what that is. And there is no possibility in the present market of somebody buying a house with that kind of repayment potential or level at the present time. So we need to address that, and it is massively beyond the reach of the, of, of, of the average house buyer, house purchaser, or house renter. And the point I want to finish with, and definitely finish with this chairman, is this. Renting was put forward as the answer to, to our prayers. It was wrong. It didn't work. And in this country, more than 100 and whatever, 50 years ago, there was a land war. It wasn't about land all. It was about the right to own their own home and the security that was in it, that was involved in it. And that's still as much alive today as it was when Michael Davitt and Parnell were involved in it. Deputy. Deputy Coppinger. Uh, hi. Um, just, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that um, Mr Lyons is the only housing expert or academic the Housing Committee has had as a witness. I think we should register that. Um, sorry? Well, I don't think housing is his sole yeah. focus, is it? Okay. Um, a number of people were suggested in this session of financing a house, though, in particular. And I just wanted to register, I think there's been a lot of more the property interests that have been, you know, testifying to the committee. I, I know you work for Daft and you made that very clear. 
um, rather than maybe people who are a bit more independent that we would have suggested as well. I just think it would have been good to have a balance of different contributions. Um, there's been uh, the landlords, the CIF, the um, chartered surveyors, there's been quite a lot have come in and a lot of the people that we suggest, for example, Construction Workers Alliance and, and others, the Dublin Tenants Association and so on. Um, but just to, in relation to one of the kind of main things that you're putting forward on this idea of a single housing subsidy, um, getting rid of the rent supplement and replacing it with this and the getting rid of the, the part five uh, and that basically a third of the population who need assistance in being able to afford a, a home would get this subsidy. But uh, so I'll, I'll go into the possible repercussions of that. Um, but would it not be just cheaper to actually build council houses? You know, I mean, it's extremely expensive to provide a subsidy of this scale. You mentioned 600 euro yourself. Um, we know how much the rent supplement costs. You know, we've paid out like billions in the last number of years to private landlords. Um, the advantage of that would be you're acquiring a permanent asset rather than subsidising private landlords. Um, you're also given secure tenure to fam families. The difficulty I see with your proposal is families are still in the position of not knowing. I've got a family at the moment who are in homeless accommodation. They've just been allocated a house in Swords. Their children go to school in Ongar, so they have to consider switching the children to another school now or drive the distance you know, each day. And you know how important school is in the life of a child and that keeping your friends, your community, you're dispensing with all that really, you know, because if people are going to be, there's no permanent security though for people in a community, in a, they'll just get this subsidy, you know. Um, and I think it's just if you compare differential rent to a council with your proposal, which I know will be cheaper for people, and I'm all for releasing, uh, reducing costs. I think the advantage from your point of view you mentioned in your presentation is you think that effectively ghettos are being created by public housing, housing council housing. Um, and I think this is something that's going to feature, and it obviously does feature in the minds of a lot of people. I think that it's become evident there's a lot of stigma attached to social housing. It's probably not a good term, social housing. It suggests that people are, have got serious social problems, you know. Um, but it, it is something that's going to have to be uh, addressed because uh, there's opposition to council housing now be, because of these things. But would it not, could I put it to you that another option would be, as existed in the past, that you would have a more diverse range of incomes in your public housing, in your local authority housing, uh, by raising the eligibility for qualifying for uh, council or social housing, and just having more diversity of incomes in the council estates, as was the case for many decades, um, and just having more people who either through affordable mortgages or um, differential rent to the council. So um, the other advantage that you seem to be arguing from your point of view of the income-based subsidy would mean that it wouldn't matter whether the house was public or privately built. You know, the, this, this whole debate. But from all the evidence that we've seen on this body is that the private rented sector is where all of the problem is located, where people are in um, terrible trauma of trying to pay rents and also insecurity. It's where people are becoming homeless right now because there's just so little um, security for people to protect them from eviction. So I just think... It, I haven't really heard anything you're putting forward that's going to get rid of those problems. Um, your, your solution would seem to be more private housing effectively because you're arguing that the subsidy will go to, to approved housing bodies. Well, okay. and come back. Rather than to councils, for example. Um, and uh, on, I think it's on page 11, you, you say that there's some interest or that there has been interest by private investors in the social housing market. Maybe you could expand on what you mean by that. Um, 
do you mean getting involved in it, or do you mean buying houses up? Or I wasn't clear. Um, just lastly, as well, I, I, I don't have time to go into. There's a whole load of things you, you raised about the loan ratios and um, property prices. But just one last thing is you, you imply in your submission that lowering the cost of building a house wouldn't necessarily... Like one of the difficulties of lowering the cost of building a house, which is argued for obviously by the construction industry, we'd all like to see the cost lowered, obviously. But um, it's how you lower it. But it can also lead to more simply being loaded onto the profits rather than the prices and rents going down. And if you want proof of that, you just have to look back on the boom when the costs were lowered dramatically for develop developers in terms of some of the tax incentives that were put out there. You know, the section, the regeneration, all the different schemes that were put in place. But it didn't lower the cost of a house and it didn't lower the rents at those times, you know, 2006 and seven, when prices were uh, rising dramatically. Thank you, Deputy. Dr Lyons, a series of questions there, if you'd like to yeah. address them, please. I think one of the points um, raised by Deputy O'Dea ties in with one of uh, Deputy Coppinger's points about um, state-owned land and perhaps something that clearly is a live issue in this committee. I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, not going to fight to the death around the local authorities versus approved housing bodies. I, I, I think the provision of social housing should not be um, left to the market. Uh, I think most people are in agreement, given the failed experiment, uh, not just in Ireland and other countries, but particularly in Ireland over the last generation around that. Um, as I say, for, for me, the reason why approved housing bodies get a sort of a slight nod over local authorities is because in the past, local authorities did build at scale and they lent at scale, but they were also significantly more financially autonomous. They could go and do these things. Um, the approved housing bodies now fill, can fill that role because the local authorities are so dependent on central government that they, they don't, they, I don't see them as having that capacity. I'm, I'm more than happy to be won over by a local authority that, that can go off and do this. But the, with the approved housing bodies, I know there are a lot of small ones, but it's the same as the, the for-profit construction sector. There are a lot of small builders as well. The point is not about the small ones, it's about the big ones. The, the top three, four, five approved housing bodies can work in partnership with um, developers and get significant scale, which I think was one of Deputy Brin's points. Um, I, I have no quantitative forecasts around uh, how much they could do overnight. Uh, it's just too much of an unknown. We don't know the parameters that would go into that. But certainly if you look at the, the Cherrywood development there, the the, over, uh, the, the, top, the developer at the top, um, which is Heinz, they're an international, uh, the Boston-based company. Um, they're working with uh, not only um, approved housing bodies, but also with healthcare providers for older persons and so on. Um, they have all this housing stock and they want to make sure it, you know, it's, it's all used. So they're talking to those bodies. They're building thousands of homes. The only thing that's missing in that jigsaw, the only thing that's stopping Clue is saying, we need 1,500 of your homes, not 150, is the link between how Clue pays Heinz and how Clue gets paid. And unfortunately, the systems we have at the moment, whether it's differential rents or whether it's um, a rent supplement or uh, part five, they don't have that link. And until you have that link, and I think this goes back to, um, oh yeah, sorry, Deputy Coppinger was interested in what, what does it mean that there's private interest in, um, in social housing. Uh, and it, this is a bit like, this is almost identical to, in fact, I think the credit union example is an example of this. The credit union saying we have, I can't remember the figure now, but three and a half billion why can't you use that for social housing? They're not gifting it. They're expecting to get paid back. Um, and it's, it's just other private money that's also saying, if you need social housing, we're looking for 4% or 5% return. So go off and use it and pay us back at 4 or 5%. Um, that's that's uh, all that I meant by that. Not that they would own it. Um, they're just rent, they're renting the money, not the, the buildings, to the housing providers, which could be local authorities or could be housing approved housing bodies. As I, say, I just think approved housing bodies could be more flexible because they can go from market to market uh, and they can partner with developers and develop relationships that provide large-scale social housing that is, as uh, Deputy Coppinger mentioned, not ghettoized. I would have a concern. Clearly, not every um, local authority project that was built uh, in the past is a ghetto, but uh, I live uh, backing onto Devney Gardens and I mean that was a 
a classic example of, of what not to do. Um, and, and in terms of rebuilding it, by, by far the most obvious thing to do with a site like that, that's close to the park and close to the Lewis, is to have people of all incomes there, um, low income and, and, and high income. Because as, as um, Deputy Durkin mentioned in, in about New York, you don't know who's who. If you have if mixed housing, you're much less likely to get um, segregation. Um, and I don't think the solution is to raise the thresholds for the current systems. Um, I also, incidentally, don't think it's financially viable to subsidise somebody on 15,000 a year, 600 euro a month. Uh, I can't remember the exact figure, maybe it was 500 euro a month. I think that's, that would bankrupt the taxpayer. So the reason I'm talking about an income-based subsidy, um, an income and cost-based subsidy, is because that, that's the best direct link between meeting people's needs. Every household has a need or a requirement for housing, and every household, that need has a cost. And if you don't connect those two things, um, then you cannot make sure that there's a meaningful right to housing for, for, for all households. Um, one point that uh, only comes up partly there, but I think is an important point, is that we need to think about building apartment blocks. Um, and this is true for social, but also true for, for the, um, the private owned and the private rented sector. Uh, it has almost never been financially viable in this country to build apartment blocks. Um, the only time it ever got done was uh, either in very high income areas, so there is some 60s and 70s apartments built in Dublin 2 and Dublin 4, Dublin 4 and Dublin 6 rather, um, or else when there was tax incentives. Um, and we have a, a real problem because the housing agency says that two thirds to three quarters of the new housing demand is going to be one and two person households. We have enough family homes, we just don't have families living in them. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's a, a big problem. And this is not about forcing older people out of their homes either. Um, people who want to stay in their homes can stay in their homes, but there are plenty of older people who would love to downsize, and there are no options for them either. Um, it's a lack of options at, at all levels and ages. Um, Deputy O'Brien asked specifically about the, the measures that have been put forward by the industry. And actually, while I'm on this, I might just mention to, uh, in, in response to Deputy Coppinger, I mean, I, yeah, I, I do work with DAFT. I'm here only in the capacity that I care about providing housing for people on all incomes, high and low, for meeting the housing needs. I'm not here in any industry sense. I don't even know if DAF know that I'm here today. It's, it's not that relationship. Um, so I would, I would tr view myself, and I try uh, to be independent and only evidence-based. Um, in terms of the measures that the industry have, have talked about, um, lower VAT, I think, is, is, it's only a small amount. I, I've looked at the numbers, and if you abolish VAT, if you make land free, and if you abolish profit, you know, if, if you have just the hard construction costs and, and maybe professional fees on top, you still cannot build apartment blocks in Cork or in Limerick and, and rent them uh, at current market rents and hope to meet your costs. So we have a huge problem around the core direct costs of, of, of building. So I would probably listen more to the quantity surveyors than the, the Construction Industry Federation on that one because we really need to get into the nitty gritty, somebody really needs to get into the nitty gritty of, of how we build and how we build in Ireland compared to other cities and find out what's gone wrong. Because the cost of, of building a home actually didn't go down in the bubble, it went up significantly in, in the bubble. Roughly speaking, in 1995, the average house was worth 120,000, and as best we can tell, it cost about 100,000 to build. Now, it went from 120 up to 360,000, and it seems like the cost roughly doubled. The cost of building a home doubled. Now, when the price of a home halved from 360 down to 180, all of a sudden, costs being at 200 is a real issue. The reason lots was being built was because the price was so high, not because costs were low in, in the bubble. Costs were actually quite high relative to our incomes. It's just we had so much um, being lent at us, uh, thrown at us, um, that, that prices went up as, as high as they did. Um, so that's why I think that the focus on costs is, is, is crucial now. And I know, apologies, I'm trying to remember who mentioned it. Oh yeah, um, Deputy Coppinger mentioned about if you lower costs, do you not just increase profits? Um, I wouldn't look at the boom for... for how that works. I would look at who's building now. The major uh, firms that are building now build on a percentage basis. They get their costs, they put in a margin on top, and if it doesn't meet that threshold, um, they're not going to build. If you lower costs, you lower the euro profit that they make on a building, not increase it, you lower it. Now you may say, well, hang on, the stuff that's being built already, yes, the profit will go up on stuff that's being built already because they, the mat's stacked up and they're building it, but almost nothing is being built compared to the need. Where society wins is 
and the developer can win as well. I, I'm not too fussed by that. For society wins is because there are more homes built, so that overall the price level or the rent level comes down. And I know there is the experience in the bubble that we think of lots of building being associated with rising prices, but that was just credit driven. It's the first um, chart that I have on page three. Um, it's just credit that's pushing up those, those, those prices in the bubble. Actually, you saw the impact of all the extra building in the next five years when the credit stopped. That extra building, particularly in areas outside of the main cities, pushed down the cost of housing. And every country you look at, the more supply, ultimately you lower um, costs and rents. Um, uh, Deputy Obrey mentioned the private rented sector, and I, I didn't actually mention that specifically, but I think it's a key part. It looks like um, uh, it's sustainable really only to have about 70% that own their own home. Anything above that seems to be just financially unsustainable so, or unstable. So of the 30%, you know, what fraction are low income and what fraction are for lifestyle reasons or at a point in their life where they want a private rent? I don't have, there's no golden rule there. Um, but the private rent sector is hugely important. Uh, I'm not in any way opposed to uh, security of tenure. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that, that uh, rent certainty measures, I think the rent certainty measures that are in are quite mild. I think stronger ones could actually hurt the people they're, they're aimed at helping because they stop new supply being, being built. But overall, I actually think that the legal side is second fiddle to the market side. Nobody was worried about uh, security of tenure in 2009 because rents were falling 10, 15, 20% year on year. If you were a tenant, you were king in the market. The real problem here is lack of market power on behalf of the tenant. Um, so if we can get more supply, you give people more power. I fully agree backing that up with security of tenure. But also as we professionalize our landlord base, that's happening anyway. These guys want to maximize occupancy. If you're, uh, if you're um, Kennedy Wilson or, or one of these companies that provides accommodation, you have no niece coming up to UCD in the autumn. You don't, you're not going to turf anyone out. You want the people to be in. Um, so you're pushing an open door there, I think, with the professional um, landlords. One last point, because I, I heard the, 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 the last chime there. Um, and it's probably a minor, minor point. Um, on the extent of flipping, um, the, uh, did flipping drive up the, the value of properties? Did excessive trading drive up the value of properties? The evidence from other countries would say it did. Uh, unfortunately, and uh, this is where the academic in me comes out, we just don't have the data to be able to say that. And uh, I, I know um, Deputy Noel Rock and I asked him to ask a parliamentary question around this last week. Can we get the Revenue Commissioner's records from 2000 to 2009, we have them from 2010 on, we don't have them from that period and we cannot answer key questions around the bubble um, without that data. So it's a small point, um, but it's symptomatic if we, if we don't view publicly owned data as something that we can use to improve our future decision making. Um, if we view it as archives or something we need to protect from other people accessing, we will end up making bad decisions. Um, I probably have gone over time there. There's so, uh, one or two brief points uh, first uh, before we conclude, uh, Deputy Lyons. Deputy, uh, uh, Dr. Lyons, uh, Deputy Maureen O'Sullivan. Yeah, I'll be very brief. And if you answer this when I was out, you can, you can tell me. Um, it's in relation to the central bank mortgage rules. And you mentioned about focusing on the minimum deposit. Um, what exactly were you suggesting in that? And my second one is just your personal opinion with the O'Devany Garden site. Do you favour building up on it? And uh, just, just before yeah. you conclude, sure. because I'll conclude with this, um, you mentioned it yourself about um, Dublin Industrial Estate, and you mentioned, I suppose, the City Council and the height and so forth. A lot of the deliberations of the committee are, I suppose, we're looking at what can be fast-tracked. But there is also the view that what we do has to have a sustainable roadmap for the future and the future needs of the city. And I suppose... I've seen Dublin evolve and change uh, considerably. Um, places, you know, that would have been a hive of activity down around the Keys. I can remember in the 70s driving into the docks where you could actually do collections where the ships actually came in. All of that has been redeveloped. But there's still a significant amount of, in the city centre and in the close proximity to the city centre, a number of industrial and brownfield sites. And at the same time then we've had regeneration with modern office blocks and you look at, you know, Googles and so forth in the city. And I'm wondering, do we need to have a more um, aggressive policy of land use for the greater, Dub well, for the Dublin city area in terms of the brownfield sites with the low level, uh, with the low densities on them are probably a thing of the past. And how do we get the mix with the population that's required to support the new, 
how do we plan for that so as we're not always playing catch up or public transport in a mess uh, we're still attracting foreign direct investment they're still locating in you know new modern office box that as you rightly say are being built and how do we convert brownfield sites maybe to residential property or how do we know how do we go about the planning of that that will sustain us over the next 5, 10, 20 years? Um, so that concludes the questions. Great. Um, uh, not great. I would love to obviously say longer, but I know you have um, another, um, another meeting. Uh, Deputy Sullivan, in relation to the minimum deposit, um, if, if, if I were starting from scratch, I, I'm not sure I would have designed it 10% up to 20% on a sliding scale. Uh, having said that, I, I do believe that... It, and I think the Governor is, in, is of the same view, that once the rules are in place, you only change them for important reasons. So I would probably leave them as is. People talk about a 20% deposit for a first-time buyer, but that would be only if they're building or buying a property worth 10 million. Uh, it's, it's, it's lower for any feasible amount that, that people are buying, closer to 10, 12%. And I, you could argue it should go down to eight. Um, I, I, again, I, I'm not going to fight to the death over that. Um, but I think 10 is there. Um, so I, I would be reluctant to change just because then it becomes something that is always tinkered with. Um, whereas let's get it up and running and people know it's there and people in their early 20s act as if it'll be there in 10 years' time. Uh, specifically in relation to Devney Gardens, and this does bring up wider issues. Um, I do think we need to build reasonably high density in that site. And, and it should, if you look at other cities, what would they do with that site? Close to a light rail, close to parklands, and you can put in schools, you can put in other public services there. Um, as a sort of, I, I describe myself once as a please in my backyard, because I can actually, I literally look out onto it. I have a wonderful view of the city, um, but I shouldn't have. There should be uh, something in there that, that people live in and, and get value out of. So I would see it as not you know, not 20 storeys, but something that, that sort of uh, arcs up in the middle um, as, as pretty high density compared to the rest of Dublin. Um, Chair, in relation to um, your, your question, um, I, I, I mentioned the Dublin Industrial Estate, and, and as I say, that's, that's got me into hot water in the past. Uh, I'll give another uh, example of, of land use that I think encapsulates what you're talking about. Um, Dublin Bus has seven depots. In, in, uh, six of them are in city centre areas. Uh, and three of those aren't near any terminus of the core Dublin bus routes, and the other three are near a couple, but most of the Dublin bus core routes actually start on the outside of the city, um, you know, closer to Harristown, um, or if there was one maybe out um, near, near Lucan, that would make sense. Um, all those six central ones share one feature in common. They were all, in the past, Dublin United Tramways Company depots. Uh, we have a land use policy in Ireland that is just last use. Whatever was done 10, 20 years ago, that's the benchmark now. We need to be a lot more aggressive. My worry about... Um, is that I, I'm not at, at all arguing for market-led um, development. My worry is that we've gone too far the other extreme, as in the planner knows best. Well, I, I'm, I'm very happy with a planner-led system, but a planner-led system where the market, as in people, can put in their suggestions. So if a developer said, uh, I'll buy that site off you and put in uh, uh, 400 apartments of which 100 are going to be social, they should have a way of doing that. It's, there's something in the UK called right to contest. Um, pardon me? No, that would never happen. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, I suppose I'm trying to be uh, optimistic in terms of uh, um, uh, let's think about possibilities. Um, I do think we need to really, really think how we use land, particularly in the city centres, because it's become last use, not best use. Okay. Uh, Dr Lyons, thank you very much for your presentation this afternoon and uh, your attendance here. And once again, apologies for ha previously having to cancel you. Uh, colleagues, thank we you suspend for just one moment and then we'll have our final witness of the afternoon.